Good morning, everyone, and welcome to New Life in the Bronx Church. I'm the lead servant, Pastor Robert Cole, and as always, I am so happy that you have decided to join us today during this time of praise and worship. Hallelujah. It's so good to praise the Lord. There's peace, there's joy in the presence of God. Hallelujah. And I'm so glad to, that Jesus is in this boat with us and, and I'm ready to hold on to him. Hallelujah. So that by his grace, we can uh, really get through these storms. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, before I go, I would just like to say, uh, a very wish a very happy birthday to Sister Crystal Estrada and Sister Cheyenne Gross. Uh, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. May the good Lord bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So once again, come on board. Come on board as we worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And let him bless you too in his mighty name. Amen. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. So wonderful to come before the Lord in prayer. We have a refuge and a strong tower. And it's just great to know that God hears us when we pray. So come with me. Let's go and let's petition our Father for the things that we need. Father in heaven, we worship you. We praise you. We thank you for being who you are. You're the father that loves us. You love us so dearly. And it's because of your love that we desire to come and sit with you just like a child sits with their father and shares everything that's on their heart. So gracious God, it's so wonderful to come before you and to ask you to put us back in order. Lord, our mind has been all over the place with everything that's happening in our nation. But when we come to you, when we go into your word, your word says that not to be, don't be like the world, but, but have your mind renewed, hallelujah. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Then we will be able to test and approve what your will is, your good, pleasing, and perfect will. We want to keep our eyes on you because as we keep our eyes on you, we have peace in the midst of the storm, like we learned last week. With Jesus in the boat, we can smile at the storms. We thank you for the promises, dear Lord, that say that when we cry out to you, you hear us and you answer us from, uh, you answer all our prayers. And so now we ask you, almighty God, help our country. Lord, your word says that a house divided against itself cannot stand. A nation divided against itself cannot stand. But as we look to you, Lord, it brings us together. As we look to you, we see that we have more in common than we have differences. Gracious God, we choose to remember that this battle that we're fighting is not against flesh and blood, but it is against rulers, against authorities, against principalities and spiritual wickedness in the heavenly realm. But we choose to put on our armor so that we could take our stand against the devil's schemes. We're not ignorant of his devices and we choose, we set our mind today to be what you've called us to be, the body of Christ the salt of the earth, the light that helps others to know where to go. And so we praise you. We take our responsibility today, the body of Christ, to war on behalf of this world, but in the heavenly realm. And for this, we praise you for the wisdom that you give us in the name of your son and our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Welcome, everybody. Let's go before the Lord. Let's do some warfare. Amen. Praise God. is warfare. Did you know that? Praise is warfare. It reminds us of who God is, what he's doing for us, and what we should be doing. Counting on him, reminding ourselves of what we have in him. I'm in a fight, not physical. I'm in a war, but not with this world. Good news, you are the light that's beautiful. I want more, I want all that's yours. What do you want? Joy unspeakable that won't go away. Just enough strength 
to live for today so i never have to worry what tomorrow will bring because my faith is on solid rock i am counting on god i'm counting on i'm counting on god i am counting on i'm counting on god i'm counting on i'm counting on god i'm counting on i'm counting on god all right let's go back to the top because we're in a fight Come on, but it's not physical, ready? I'm in a fight, not physical. I'm in a war, but not with this world. You are the light that's beautiful. Come on, you want more? I want more. I want all that's yours. I want some joy. Joy unspeakable that won't go away. Just enough strength to live for today. So I never have to worry what tomorrow will bring. Come on, who you counting on? I'm counting on, 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 When you call, that you hear me, yes, you hear me, Lord. When I call. 
even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can feel it, you're working. But I know you never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. You never To see it, you work. Even when I can feel it, you work. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work. Even when I can feel it, you work. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you make me. So be brave, be strong and courageous for the Lord our God is fighting for us. You make me brave. You call me out. I'm going to show you the way. I'm going to show you the way. I will not fear. I'm coming where you are, Lord. For you are I'm going to walk on water and trust I no, I have no fear. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wasn't that a glorious time of praise as we continue to worship the Lord our God? Praise God. Uh, just want to say thank you to Sister Josie and Sister Wendy for leading us in praise as we prepare our hearts and our minds to hear the word of God. That's why taking the time to uh, praise the Lord with our praise leaders uh, is so important. Because as we do that, God prepares us by the power of his Holy Spirit to uh, hear his word and receive what he has to say to us. In Jesus' mighty name, as always. Hallelujah. You know, in Romans chapter 1 to 8, Paul points out man's need for salvation. And as well, God's plan for salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. Now, as we move on to chapter 9 through 11, Paul will deal with the problem 
associated with the spiritual, the spiritual rather, condition of Israel, noting that, noting the fact that not all Israelites will receive God's promises, which, uh, which brings up the question, how can we know? How can we know who God will bring to the place he promised? Or do we have, or really, or do we have to worry? Do we have to worry about being rejected by him? This question, uh, this is the question that Christians are also asking about themselves, and they also ask this question as they are going out to minister the gospel to others. Paul will deal with the Jewish condition over the next three chapters, as he continues to support his position that salvation, amen, salvation is a gift from God that cannot be obtained by works or by our current position in any group or, or in society. Here, Paul will help us understand the importance of totally relying on God for all that we need instead of relying on ourselves and the things of this world. Today, I want to remind us that God is God. Amen. I love the way that sounds. That God is God and that he oversees all aspects of our lives, whether we accept him or not. Today, life and religion have become more about what Humans want and humans think, and we have put God in a small box. Uh, and, 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 and it's to the point that we are begin, beginning to eliminate God from uh, the aspects, uh, the various aspects of our lives. Today we hear more and more about mankind and what they can accomplish through their own abilities, uh, than relying on God to raise us up and do his perfect will. It's almost as if relying on God uh, to, to, to raise you up and to guide you and to deliver you and to free you and all the wonderful things that he does in blessing us, it's almost as if relying on God uh, makes you appear weak. You know, perhaps this happens because we have forgotten just how powerful God really is and how he is able to exercise his will to the glory of his name. Perhaps we have made God so small that we no longer see him in the vastness of his glory. It would appear that we have, have lost our understanding that God is sovereign and is the authority of all things. Not some things, but all things. Romans, in Romans, uh, they will con he, Paul will continue to build on uh, our need for salvation while building uh, answers to difficult complaints that have come up along the way. Now, it's, it's true. It is true that Romans chapter 9 is, one for, is, is a chapter for deep study. So instead of teaching on every point, I want to focus on God's sovereignty. Amen? I also want, to real, I also want us to realize that this is a chapter heavily relied on by those who focus on predestination the theology of predestination, but I'm not going to focus on trying to prove or disprove if all who are saved have been chosen by God before time. But what I, I want to acknowledge, I do, I do want to acknowledge the sovereignty of God, that God is sovereign and that he is above all things, and that he is the ultimate authority in our lives. I, I, I want to acknowledge that, that God's call for all people 
is that, that he has made a call for all people to be saved. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter, 1 Timothy rather, chapter 2, verse 3 to 6, this is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, amen, and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority, not some, but all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. You know, saints, we have a job given by our Lord Jesus Christ to go and to tell to baptize and teach all people, not some, but all people, to follow the Lord God, regardless of whether uh, they were predestined to receive salvation or they choose to accept salvation through Jesus Christ. We, our job has, uh, the job that we have been given is to go out. Uh, and as the, the, the song says, go and tell it on the mountain. Amen. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. Today, I want to remind us uh, of the power of God. I want us to recognize that almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, uh, the sovereign God, has made known his wonderful plan of salvation uh, that comes through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We are made righteous, by which rather we are made righteous and uh, are promised the gift of eternal life. God has made that known to us, saints. Hallelujah. How glorious that is. If your God is small, then that's not a glorious thing. But if your God is the creator of the universe, hallelujah. If your God is, 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 is the God that has all authority, all authority has been given unto him. Or, or, or is his, rather, not even given unto him, but is his, then guess what? Hallelujah. You have a big God, and the fact that he would share his plan of salvation, his way back, is a glorious thing in Jesus' name, Jesus' mighty name. So today, I would like to entitle this sermon, God is Sovereign, Not Influenced by Outside Forces. Once again, God is sovereign, and he's not influenced by outside sources, praise the Lord, or forces in this case. Uh, as the creator, we are, we are, or, or, or as his creation rather, right? He's the creator, we are his creation. As his creation, we are to trust him with every aspect of our lives, amen? With our whole life, we are to trust him. That's what we are called to do. And I believe Paul is going to show that, show us that today through the scripture. Amen. We are called to trust in the Lord in, in, in every way that we can. Because he is sovereign. He is sovereign. That means he has all authority. And he is not influenced by any outside force. Amen. Hallelujah. So as we get ready to, to open and, and read Romans chapter 9 verses 1 to 16, would you come and, and, and join me in a word of prayer? Let us pray. Father God who art in heaven, we thank you. You are the creator. You are our, our sovereign Lord. And you have chosen to give us life. You have chosen to show us the gift of salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. You have chosen, O oh Lord God, to be mighty in our lives. And so, Father, in your precious name, we come to you. We come to you and we surrender our lives and our time to you at, right now, asking you, O oh Father, to speak to us and to uh, transform us 
by your word. Renew our mind and lighten up our spirit that we may praise you and walk with you all the days of our lives. We pray this now in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So would you come with me and read in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 16. And the word of God reads like this. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is adoption to sonship. Theirs is divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. It is not though, it is not though God, it is not though God's word has failed. For not all who are descendants from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children, uh, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this is how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet, before the twins were born, or had done anything good or bad, in order, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the, order will, the older rather will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or efforts, but on God's mercy. And let me read that last uh, verse, verse 16, once again. Hallelujah. It does not, therefore, depend on human desires or efforts, but on God's mercy. Hallelujah. Once again, we're talking about the sovereignty of God. And, and, and we've entitled this sermon, God is Sovereign. Not influenced by outside forces. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's able to save who he wills by his grace. Amen. Hallelujah. He's able to do this because righteousness is not dependent on human desires or efforts, but on God's mercy. Hallelujah. It's dependent on God's mercy. That's why God is sovereign and he's able to hold us and keep us until the very last day. Hallelujah. Paul opens up today's text by sharing his great sorrow that there are members of the people of Israel that have been cut off from Christ and God's promise. Hallelujah. Uh, he, wants to, he wants the hearers of this message to understand that he is saying, what he is saying rather, is truth. And he was not lying. It is apparent that his message would, would be a surprise to some, if not many, of the hearers who thought that certainly, certainly God's chosen people will be with the Father in paradise. If anyone, if anyone's going to make it to paradise, it's going to be God's chosen people, Israel. But here Paul shows a uh, uh, let me say, here, 
Paul shows his love. His love for people that have rejected God's gift and his message of salvation. Paul's example reminds us that those who reject God's message are our brothers and members of the same human race that we belong to. You know, sometimes there there is so much attention and energy focused on building up hate and anger for those who oppose the message of Christ. And for those who, who, who live in ways that are starkly contrast to the holiness of God. Perhaps we have forgotten that God still desires that they, those people who live contrarily or contradictory to God's promise, that, that God still desires that, that they would repent of their evil ways and come to him. He also wants us to understand that uh, the decision regarding who is saved belongs to the sovereign Lord and not us. So that we can, he wants us to know this so that we can stop judging and start loving. Amen. Hallelujah. That we can stop judging. Stop taking that, that responsibility to judge others and start taking the uh, uh taking on the responsibility of loving others in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. I believe God wants us to have the same love and compassion that Paul exhibited here, wishing that uh, uh, he himself was cursed and lost forever, switching places with his fellow Israelites so that they would not have to suffer a life without God. Because that's what it is. A life apart from God is a life of suffering. Although it seems to some that uh, uh, people are doing well without God. Trust me, that's only for a moment and only for a season. But the time will come when judgment will be passed by God. And those who are apart from God will suffer. While those who are part of God's family, hallelujah, will be with him in paradise. Hallelujah. Uh, This great love, this great love that Paul had for others is is what drove him to preach the gospel. This love and passion for others led Paul to take his attention off the petty cares we give so much of our energy to. It allowed him to, to imagine that these people were sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Imagine if we were to expend the energy and develop the passion to see lives saved. If we use that same energy and that same passion uh, to see lives saved rather than uh, to change people's behaviors by shaming and ostracizing them. What, imagine what would happen if we loved them and prayed for them the way we reject, we reject them and leave them for hell. Paul's statement in verse one, uh, uh, that he is speaking the truth in Christ and is not lying, noting that his feelings were confirmed by the Holy Spirit, shows that his feelings were sincere. And I thank God, I thank God Almighty that Paul had surrendered his life to him, to God, so that he would remain obedient to the instructions that God had given him to go to the Gentiles and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for Paul's obedience. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you so very much. You know, although Paul desired to uh, experience the suffering that awaited those who rejected the gospel message of Christ, 
he had come to the realization that he could not switch places with them. He could not change places with his unsaved brothers. That job was already taken. It was already taken by God who had come in the flesh through Jesus Christ. No matter how much Paul loved his brothers, the Israelites, he realized that it is God who is sovereign and able to take upon his shoulders the sin of the world. We see in, in, in Romans that Paul did not attempt to live another's calling. Instead, he followed the calling that was placed or given to him by God Almighty to bring the gospel message, the good news gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Think about how powerful our lives will be if we, like Paul, exhibited the confidence to walk with God and follow his calling and follow the instructions that he has for our lives. Imagine what our lives would be like if we lived with God instead of trying to walk for God, amen, and do his responsibility. Once again today, today, hallelujah, we are being reminded that God is sovereign and not influenced by outside forces. So let's, let's move to verse 4. Where, where, there, where, where in verse 4 and also in verse 5, Paul spends time highlighting the blessings that were bestowed upon the Israelites. Paul revered that Israel had a special place in God's heart. He noted that they were adopted sons, right? Highlighting that God chose them by his grace for his purpose, his choice, that God chose them and raised them as his chosen people. God revealed his glory to this group of people, traveling with them and protecting them for his glory. God made his covenant, his covenant with Israel, giving them the law to illustrate how they were to live their lives. But the greatest gift, amen, amen, the greatest gift came through them. The greatest gift of the Messiah, who is God, amen. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come through the line of Judah. Amen, hallelujah, praise God. Perhaps the truth of knowing that Israel was given uh, these great gifts by the grace of the sovereign God made him even made him Paul even more distressed that they rejected the Messiah Jesus Christ. So what happened? What happened that resulted in Israel rejecting Jesus Christ? Paul immediately immediately dispels any possible idea that God, that God's word had failed. In verse 6, he states that it is not as though God's word failed, because God has not failed. Well, what happened? What happened then? Before we delve into this uh, section of scripture, we, we must uh, understand that Paul is addressing and that he is speaking to Jewish people in Rome, and he is making his argument using Old Testament scriptures that, that this group of Jewish individuals would understand. Paul is making a New Testament argument using Old Testament scriptures that the Jewish hearers would not only understand, but they would also agree with. He's continuing to make the point that God is sovereign. And it is by his decision and his decision alone that we are saved by his grace that comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul's argument, starting in verse 6, once again will highlight that we are not saved. 
that people are not saved by their flesh, meaning their bloodlines, uh, their bloodlines to Abraham, but that their willingness to live in obedience to the promises of God. Amen. In other words, to put it in New Testament terms, we are saved by faith in Christ who is God's plan for salvation, not by works. Salvation is the gift of God, so nobody can boast. Amen? That's God's purpose. Hallelujah. Paul notes that God's word has not failed because not all who are descendants of Israel are Israel. Now, if, if, if you get that on the first pop, you're good. Because I read that not all Israel are Israel. And I wanted to go and preach another sermon. <laughs> I wanted to find another scripture. Because like we said, this was not always going, not everything that Paul writes is easily understood. But hallelujah for scholars that, that have gone before me and have, have, have dealt with this. And thank God for the Holy Spirit that would help me to begin to understand. Even if just the aspect, enough that I would need to get through this week's sermon. Amen. Hallelujah. And the Bible says in verse 7, nor are his descendants all Abraham's children. So using the word of God found in Genesis chapter 17 verses 18 to 21, he points out that not all of Abraham's children are of the tribe of Israel, the nation that God established his covenant with. Listen to what God says to Abraham about his plan. In verse 18, and Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his grace. I mean, for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers. And I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant, I will establish, watch this, listen to this, but my covenant, verse 21, but my covenant, I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. You see why faith is so important in, in our relationship with God? Because God doesn't give you the answer. He gives you the answer, but he, he, he doesn't uh, uh, display his answer all at once. He let, he, he, he let Abraham know that, oh no, it will not come through Ishmael. It's going to come through Isaac. Isaac had not even come yet. So God requires faith to continue marching on. You can trust the word that God says, but there are many times where you will have to continue marching on in faith until God delivers on his promise. Amen. You know, those who believe that they are saved because they are descendants of Abraham are not saved by his blood because God did not establish his covenant through Abraham and all and all Abraham's children were not part of Israel Paul wanted them to know that they could not rest their salvation on any of their descendants or on any name except the name of Jesus because as it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Amen. Nothing, no one, nothing but the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And not all who were descendants from Israel are Israel. Now, remember that Israel is the, is the name of both a nation and a person. 
Jacob's name was changed to Israel. In Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, God invites Israel, the nation. Let me make sure this thing starts to thing. Hallelujah. It's not down yet. There's real things going on. If God isn't calling me right now, I don't wish to know. Amen. Hallelujah. In Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, God invites Israel, the nation, the nation Israel, to join him. And he says, now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Amen. Not all descendants, not all of the descendants from Israel are Israel shows that those who are able to obey and trust in God. Amen. Trusting God would be the true nation of Israel. And, and we know, we know that, that they're in their own strength, they could not live the holy lives that, that, that God was talking about. So in order to be the true nation of Israel, they would have to rely on God's sovereignty, and they would have to rely on God's grace. But they would have to walk with God, amen? Just like we do today. We have to walk in the spirit, walk with God, and we lean not on our own strength, but we lean on his grace and his power to forgive and to keep us moving forward by his grace. Hallelujah. Verse 8 summarizes this section, noting that God's children are not the children by physical descent, but it is by the promise of of God. Amen. Paul proceeds to recall the promise of God that came by, uh, uh, by the angels in Genesis chapter 18, verses 10 and also verse 14, that at God's appointed time, not man's, but God's, he would return and Sarah would have a son. Now remember, Sarah and her husband were old. And, and not physically able to have children. But by the promise of God, amen, God, by his sovereignty, one year later, would open Sarah's womb, amen, and she would conceive. Once again, God shows that it is all about his plan and by his power that he lifts up who he will, amen, who he will. Because he is sovereign. And because God has authority over all things, we today can trust in the salvation he has granted to us by his mercy. Without concern that he fails those who have faith in him. Paul strengthens his position by reminding the Jewish people that before the twins were born, Jacob and Esau, before the twins were born to Sarah and Isaac, and before they did anything good or bad, by God's choice, amen? We can't miss that. By God's choice, not by works, Sarah was told, the older will serve the younger. And that's found in Genesis chapter 25, verse 23. Some try to say that God did this because Esau sold his birthright. But our text today reminds us that the decision God made was made before the brothers were born. The birth, the birth order, along with God's commitment uh, uh, in, in verse 13, or God's comment, rather, in verse 13, where he says, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Emphasize that God can choose one over the other. 
Now let me make a quick note here. Uh, the scripture is not that God hates Esau. Because the, the Hebrew word is, is used differently than we use hate in, 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 in the English language. What he is saying here is that he has chosen Jacob over Esau. And usually the order was that the older went before the younger. But it's by God's choice. The sovereignty of God. It is by the sovereignty of God that God, that God chose Jacob over Esau. This was done for his glory and his glory alone. So we don't understand everything. Maybe you do, but I don't understand everything about God. I cannot comprehend the things of God. But I, I can only ask God by the power of the Holy Spirit to help me understand using the tools that we have today to help me understand a little bit more of what he is, is saying in his scriptures. And in that scripture, he's not saying he hates Esau, but what he's saying is that he has chosen Jacob for his glory, for his purpose. He has chosen Jacob over Esau. Therefore, Paul responds to the question asked in verse 14, or Paul's response, rather, to the question asked in verse 14 is the question that says, is uh, the question that asked, rather, is God just? He responds that, that God responds, using God's response, that God responds, I will have mercy. Amen. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Woo. Praise the Lord for his word. You know, God's going to do what God's going to do. Ours is not to question why. But ours is to trust that God is sovereign and, and has his hand over all things. And that God works out for good. Right? For the good of those who love him and are called by his name. Amen? Ours is to trust. Ours is to trust the Lord and do God's command and God's bidding here on earth. Verse 16 provides the explanation for what Paul writes about uh, uh, writes about in verse 13, making it clear that his salvation and his actions do not depend on human desires or efforts, but on God's mercy. Amen. God, everything God does is to extend his mercy to his people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here we see that God is God. I just love that statement. It's so simple. God is God. That's who he is. And that our salvation and his promises are not determined on what we think or do, but is totally in God's hand. So that's, what God, that's what that means, that God is God. What, what, what he does for us that our salvation and that his promises are not based on what we think or on what we do. We can try to be as straight as we want to be, but it's not based on what we think or what we do. We can say we are from such and such a line. Our grandmama was a Christian. Our granddaddy was a Christian. Our great-grandparents were a Christian. Our parents were a Christian. Our brothers are a Christian. Our, our sisters are a Christian. I want to tell you today until you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you cannot say that you are a Christian. Amen. Amen. Turn your heart upon Jesus. Hallelujah. Look forth in his wonderful face and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And you too will accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. You know, this information we have today impacts on how we view our salvation. It should impact how we view our salvation. It should also take our thoughts and judgment uh, out of out of the equation when determining others another person's worth to be saved. Just as we look to God for salvation, we should look to God when uh, uh, look to God when presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. In other words, allow the sovereignty or allow the sovereign 
and holy God to be your guiding force. Amen. Making you and others worthy of salvation through God. I believe that God is using this point to show his sovereignty to operate without outside influence. He has uh, desired that people, all people, receive salvation by faith in Christ. Therefore, it is not our place to question someone's worthiness for salvation because we can trust that God is sovereign and able, hallelujah, and able to save those he desires. And, 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 and the word tells us he desires all. So he's able to save those he desires to extend his grace and love to, which once again is all his creation, which once again is you, which once again is me. God desires to save us. That's why he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have the gift of eternal life. I tell you today, saints, we can trust in God to save and to keep our salvation until the last day through Christ who intercedes daily for you and me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to take, take your minds off the things of this world. Stop trying to determine if you're worthy. Stop trying to determine if others are worthy. Hallelujah. Uh, and, and begin to understand that God is worthy. God is sovereign. And no one else influences God. Hallelujah. He has made it through Jesus Christ. By his grace, he has made it that we, whether we think we deserve salvation or not, that we can receive the gift of salvation that comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. I pray, I pray that you are getting the understanding. Hallelujah. I pray that you are understanding what God is laying on us today. Hallelujah. I want to encourage you, before I leave, I want to encourage you to trust God today for salvation and for a better life in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by him. And God desires that you would come to him. That you would come to the Father. But it has to be done through Jesus Christ. And so, if you are getting this understanding, and God is ministering to you right now, would you say this prayer of salvation with me? You only need to say it once. And God will take hold of you. And God will begin to shape you and mold you and sanctify you to walk according to his glory. Not that you have to become perfect, but he who saves you, he who sanctifies you, he who glorifies you is perfect. Hallelujah. So that we don't have to be perfect because he is perfect. So say this prayer of salvation with me, if you will. Father God, I come today in Jesus' name to acknowledge that Jesus died rose from the dead so that we might be saved. I believe that Jesus sits at God's right hand side and intercedes for us here on earth. I believe that Jesus is my Lord. And so I ask you to forgive my sins and to accept me as one of your children a follower of Jesus Christ. And I accept this gift of salvation in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I pray you were blessed at this, with this offering of God's word. I pray that God came to you and met you and spoke to you and, and helped you to once again to remember that he is sovereign and that he does not need nor want nor use any outside influences to change his mind. God is sovereign. He's made up his mind. He wants all people saved. Come, join Jesus. Hallelujah. Join God's family through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God has given us all the weapons we need to walk with him instead of for him. And so I ask God's blessing upon us all. Until next time we meet, God bless you and keep you. In Jesus' mighty and wonderful name, amen.